You are living in the beginning of the information age. Our whole world is powered by computers, machines which do billions of calculations every second. But only 70 years ago, computers were human beings. Until, that is, Alan Turing invented a machine that could do the work. Turing first came up with the idea of a computing machine to solve a key mathematical problem of the day. Not content to leave this on paper, he was soon planning to turn it into a real, working computer. However, the war was to delay his plans, and it was only when he was asked to join the National Physical Laboratory that he could begin to design in earnest. Design what was to become the pilot, automatic computing engine. After the war, Alan Turing, who had been working on breaking the German codes at Bletchley, joined the mathematics division when it was formed at NPL in 1945. Well, most of NPL didn't know that he'd been involved in this code-breaking work during the war. Totally Still secret. Too hush -hush. Absolutely, it was hush hush for another oh, long after he'd left NPL. Mm. Nobody was supposed to talk about it or those that knew about it. And moreover, his qualifications included experience of electronics. And again, nobody knew at that time that there was going to be an electronic computer. That was just not mentioned. Until 1946, a complete description by Alan Turing was put before the executive committee of the NPL, and they approved it in a uh, month later. The mathematics division expanded and included a team dedicated to getting the computer built. Turing, however, developed a reputation amongst his colleagues of being a bit difficult. Jim Wilkinson and I were recruited by Goodwin to join the new division, and uh, Jim was to work half-time on developing numerical methods and half-time to work with Turing. Now, most of the time he'd work with Turing, but uh, Turing could have an off day when he was in a real, uh, really foul mood, and Jim would, would uh, decide that was a good day to go and work f with for his other half. Turing had these, these moods, but they would usually pass. They didn't mean too much. Uh, you just had to weather the storm and get on with something else. Though Mike Woodger, as Turing's assistant, got to know a very different side to him. He was so gentle and uh, he was a very private man and I was very shy. It turned out, although he had all this experience, he was a very shy man too. In fact, the other day I came across a letter I thought I'd lost. You see, when I joined in 1946, most of the August, I was away, sick, because I, I picked up a glandular fever. Both Wilkinson and Turing were away on one reason or another. Uh, from the lab, and then they realised, Turing realised that I was going to come back and there'd be nobody to supervise me, you see. Well, being the man he was, he wrote an absolutely charming letter, uh, so apologising for them not being there, and a list of things I might do. And knowing that I was probably feeling a bit, a bit weak with a glandular fever, he said, you know, read a book, <laughs> or this, this and this, various, various kind of suggestions. It turned out that Turing's time at MPL was to be brief. He left after two years, frustrated at the slow progress on a prototype of his design, the Pilot Ace. Morale on the project collapsed, and construction only got a second wind when MPL's electronics section offered to help, coming together with those in mathematics to build the hardware. Though Jim Wilkinson was now in charge, Turing had left a strong legacy. There wouldn't have been a Pilot Ace without Turing. He produced, astonishingly, a complete description of a machine. And we used that and went on from there. It was sufficiently complete for him to know what to do next. Now that's, that's astonishing, utterly astonishing. They had a working computer. And that was immediately put to use. It wasn't supposed to be used for calculating, but that was what Jim wanted.
and that's what happened. I knew Jim from 1941, knew him well. I only once knew him upset, and that was when he'd been to a meeting over here where they were discussing what to do with the pilot ace, a and what the proposal then was that we should abandon it and get on with building the full-scale ace. Uh, and he, he was really cross about this, and he tackled Goodwin, uh, who knew of potential customers, and between them they, they, they built up a case for retaining it. It was a going concern, calculating. And that's where uh, Jim Wilkinson w was interested in speeding all that up by a factor of 100 or so. And that's the uh, impact that the pilot has really made, that it was this fantastically fast computer. And Turing was very keen on the speed. He was prepared to sacrifice a lot in the design for the sake of be being as fast as possible. The Pilot Ace was finally finished in 1950 and unveiled in a three-day public and press extravaganza. They referred to it as the MPL electronic brain, didn't they? Yeah. Yes, they're asking here in the press release for anyone who knows what use they could make of it, any problems they would like solving, touting for business. Good one. This is it. Did you actually operate from here, Tom? Were you? This was the operator's <laughs> desk, and uh, it, it was very user friendly. The Pilot Ace became the first computer available for hire. Work flooded in from those in government and industry desperate to do their calculations in a fraction of the time. Much of the custom came from Britain's burgeoning aircraft industry. A big test for the computer came with one of the first passenger airline disasters. It had to calculate the cause of the mid-air explosion of a Comet aircraft, which killed 35 people. No Comet has flown with passengers since January. For in that month, Yoke Peter, the comet which smashed all records on a flight to Johannesburg four years ago, crashed with the loss of 35 lives. Yoke Peter took off from Rome Airport on schedule. A few minutes later, the plane exploded. Ships of the Royal Navy hastened to the spot, but there were no survivors. Immediately, BOAC grounded all comets, and the search began for the wreckage. Thus, the most extensive investigation of its kind ever held was started. Thinking part of its shell had burst, they placed another comet in an enormous tank of water and took measurements of the pressure on the aircraft. It was up to the pilot Ace to calculate where the metal had cracked. Eight million multiplications was a small part of the job. That's a lot of multiplying, eight million. <laughs> um, and eventually uh, we found the answer to the comet disaster. Britain salutes the backroom boys who have spared nothing to solve the comet mystery and to put the record-breaking airliner back in the forefront of modern aviation. He earned, well, I thought, £100,000. Now, that seems peanuts to you people these days, but I think my salary is probably five or £600 a year. We were earning money from testing thermometers, maybe a penny a time or taxi meters, pound a time maybe. Uh, we earned a lot from our ship tank, but this was big money uh, as far as the lab was concerned. Once we realized what we were capable of doing, people got to hear about it, uh, and uh, this was the only machine around. We, we, we just filled up. It was all very new to them, what the machine could do. It was very new to us. I could do multiplication in 15 seconds on a Brunswick and if I could find a machine that did it in 13 seconds, I, could, I was pleased to have it. And suddenly I can do it in a 500th of a second. You know, it's a big impact. It's, it's the, 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 this, the revolution, uh, information revolution, was very different from the industrial revolution, which lasted over many years. Think of how much quicker a train has got over the last hundred years. N not a lot. Think of what's happened in computing, how much quicker, quicker they've got in a short time. And this, this short time it was about five years. I mean, we're seeing, still seeing the effects of it. 
it was a real revolution.